So the tabletop game of Warhammer 40k is a colossal and varied one, and in this video we're going to go through each faction in the game and roughly how it feels to play them. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where today we're going to be talking about each faction in the game and how it feels to command one of their armies in game. Generally the majority of the factions in the game can be played in multiple different ways, with a bunch of units that can fill multiple battlefield roles. There's nothing to stop you taking some slightly more out there choices, such as an entirely ranged Chaos Demons army, or fully close combat Admech, but in general certain factions tend to push you in slightly different ways in terms of their army's synergies, special rules, and their unit's powers. In this video we're going to be going through each faction in the game in turn, a few of the different ways that you can play them, some of the key units for each faction, and any quirky special rules that they might have. Let's jump straight into it then, starting with the Space Marines. So few armies in 40k are quite as unconstrained as the forces of the Adeptus Astartes. They've got an enormous range of miniatures, and thus they can do virtually any playstyle. Each marine is fairly proficient in both close combat and range normally, and they're well armoured and very durable to enemy fire. Provided it's revolving around elite infantry of some sort, Space Marines can do it, they just don't really have any true horde style units to flood the board with bodies. They tend to be fairly direct and brutal with their approach, maybe not having quite as many tricks or sneakiness as some of the other factions. Space Marine armies often tend to be quite flexible, often mixing powerfully brutal firepower with devastating charges from scary marines with power weapons. As I'm sure almost everyone's aware of right now, they're very very strong. They've got good efficient units and a massive amount of ways to customise them with all their different supplement chapter books. Just some of the ways that you can play Space Marines are these ones below. You can line up a bunch of Marines on the battle line and advance forwards laying down Bolter Fire. You can go for a Dreadnought heavy list and stomp towards the opponent with a whole bunch of angry walking sarcophagi. They can do mechanised infantry fairly well, things like Impulsors with Assault Intercessors or Rhinos with Tactical Marines in. You can have Arrow Quick Attack Forces with Bike and Speeder heavy lists, things like Dark Angel's Raven Wing or White Scars can do this fairly well. You can have stomping forces of super elite infantry, things like Primaris Gravis Armour or Terminator Armoured Forces. Salamanders do Gravis Armour quite nicely. Bloodthirsty Jump Infantry Forces, leaping forward across the battlefield to engage the foe in melee or dropping down out of the skies. And you can even do some infiltrating sort of Spec Ops forces to harass and annoy the enemy rather than dealing with them head on, using things like Phobos style units and certain chapter shenanigans such as Raven Guard. To support all of this, you can also add in things like some artillery pieces, they do have whirlwinds and thunderfire cannons, or a few space marine flyers, though their strategies don't tend to entirely revolve around these this edition. Of course, which way space marines play does tend to vary heavily based on their chapter, so let's go through each of them now. So first up we have the ultramarines, I think that they do very well with their advancing gunline type build, they can move and still fire bolters to their maximum effective range fall back and still shoot, and they have a whole ton of really powerful buffing characters that really want to be in the centre of a big battle line. They're fairly generalist, and really emphasise battlefield command as the way to get things done. A couple of their more powerful pieces are the Seal of Oath Relic, which can absolutely allow you to focus down one enemy threat right from turn 1, and they have the ability to redeploy some things pre-game to get an advantage over your opponents. Next up we have White Scars, who are all about devastating speed, and hit and run tactics with assault units. They're very strong as Space Marines go right now, being really good with things like Vanguard Veterans and Outriders and other bike units. Most White Scars units are going to want to advance every single turn, as a lot of them can still shoot and assault even after they've done that. They'll just be far far quicker at getting to grips with the foe than pretty much any other Space Marine chapter. Next we have Iron Hands. They have really good synergy with tanks and dreadnoughts, are extra durable on their infantry, and get their own unique Devastator Doctrine to allow them to move and fire heavy weapons turn 1. They've got a fair few of their own unique tricks, including Iron Father Phyros, who can give 5 plus invul saves to nearby infantry, and their Ironstone Relic, which can make one vehicle just exceptionally hard to kill. Generally, they're going to want a lot of heavy vehicles and obliterate the enemy with cold logical firepower. Next up, we have the Raven Guard, who try and push Space Marines in a bit more of a guerrilla warfare sort of style, making their units hard to deal with at range, being extra good at sniping down and killing enemy commanders and also having a couple of really good stratagems, allowing them to infiltrate units up the board turn 1, or deep strike them from reserve, even if they're units that can't normally do so. In reality, this actually often tends to be better on really heavily armoured things, things like aggressors or centurions, as if you can do really sneaky redeployment tricks with really heavy units, it does tend to work out better. In addition, they've got a few jump pack synergies, Chapter Master Shrike is pretty excellent, 
and they've got a few tricks with getting jump pack marines right up the board and right into the enemy's face turn 1. Next up we have the Salamanders, who as a whole tend to emphasise just slow moving durability and raw power. They don't really have any redeployment or movement type tricks, but everything from their chapter tactic to combat doctrine just makes them tougher and hits harder. In particular having great synergy with Melter and Flamer weapons, getting plus 1 to wound with both of these when they're in their unique tactical doctrine. They can get plus 1 to wound with their Crucible of Battle stratagem, which makes virtually any unit more dangerous. It can have exceptionally hard to kill characters. And they work quite well with things like Gravis Armour and Eradicators, who go with quite a lot of this slow moving raw power synergies really quite well. They're really quite a strong chapter in 9th edition. Imperial Fists go in for bolters and anti tank weapons, perhaps the biggest gunline faction out of all the Space Marine chapters. They get extra hits on sixes with all bolt weapons, which are really common throughout the Space Marine army, ignores cover on everything, and a few more buffs to their shooting, such as the Eye of Hypnoth or the Tank Hunter's Stratagem. Their chapter tactic really is quite powerful, but they don't have all that many other powerful tricks of their own compared with some of the other chapters, and are perhaps struggling a bit compared with the rest at the moment. Crimson Fists basically get most of the things that Imperial Fists get, but swap out their Ignores cover for a bit more power against Hordes, and they get their own unique character Pedro Cantor, who's fairly nice in melee himself. Black Templars are a very melee focused chapter, they get more reliable charges, re-rolling the dice, and also their unique doctrine helps them out with things like chainsaws or low strength weapons against infantry. You're likely to want multiple melee threats pushing forwards, often led by chaplains who can get their own unique litanies with powerful results, and they have a few really helpful tricks for melee armies, including devout push to let a lot of their units get into melee when they really shouldn't, an advance and charge stratagem, and the crusader helm which can allow them to get to their unique assault doctrine early. I'm not sure they've got quite as much raw strength as some of the other chapters, but a lot of their individual tricks make up for it. Now we're getting into some of the more diversion chapters with a lot more of their own unique options, and we come to the Blood Angels. The Sons of Sanguinius also get very easy charges with plus one to every charge and advance roll, and are absolutely devastating in melee when they get there, getting plus one to their wound rolls. Most stereotypically, most Blood Angels leaders are going to want a decent amount of jump infantry, as well as the excellent Vanguard veterans, but they've also got things like Sanguinary Guard and Death Company, both of which have their merits. Death Company can get a nice pre-game move for turn 1 charges, though Sanguinary Guard are perhaps some of the best assault troops in the entire game right now. They've got plenty of nice named characters to lead them into battle, many of which provide decent melee buffs when they get there, and then you can just seed in a fair few efficient Space Marine support firepower units, such as Inceptors perhaps, who can get additional accuracy after they come down onto the field of battle with Descent of Angels. I would certainly say that Blood Angels are one of the strongest Space Marine chapters right now, being utterly lethal in close combat. Next up we come to the Dark Angels, who are pretty much a chapter divided into three parts, nearly unkillable elite terminators in the Death Wing, Raven Wing units with their very fast biker and land speeder movement, and all sorts of shenanigans that you can do with that, including pre-game moves and charging them falling back, backed up with their other units that get powerful gunline buffs, and whenever their gunline units remain stationary, they get incredibly accurate. You can kind of have any combination of those elements, whether you want Terminators with Raven Wing support, or Solid Gunline with just a few of the other elements. Perhaps some of the scariest Raven Wing units are things like Black Knights, who can hit quite hard in combat, and also fry people with plasma weapons. They're pretty fragile, but they can get enormous amounts of movement and should be able to keep safe with some trickery. Their Deathwing Terminators can only ever be wounded on a 4+, plus, thanks to transhuman physiology, and can also get objectives secured in their own Vanguard detachment. They can solidly slog forward through enemy fire, as are among some of the toughest things in the game to take down right now. All of their more standard Greenwing type units can be extra accurate, as we said, and they've got some really powerful character tricks as well, such as Ezekiel turning off enemy objectives secured, Azrael making everyone tougher to enemy fire around them, and their own buffed chaplains, who can be really hard to kill and give some good buffs. Perhaps one of the most powerful tricks to the Dark Angels is weapons from the Dark Age. It really rewards you for taking a massive unit of plasma weapons, whether that's Inceptors, Hellblasters or Black Knights. As for just 2 CP, it makes them utterly lethal against pretty much any target. Strength wise at the moment, it looks like Dark Angels are pretty much top tier. Next up we come to the Sons of Ross with the Space Wolves. Another very melee focused chapter, but with quite a different feel to the Blood Angels. They often tend to have a fair few more ground based units, often slogging up the board with things like Thunderhammers and Storm Shields, led by powerful but slower moving hero characters, or with their own tricks. I'd say they're one of the better armies for doing an Impulsor Rush type strategy, with Primaris melee marines piling out of Impulsors. 
supported by some other hard-hitting heavy melee elements. In terms of their most iconic units, a hard-hitting unit of Thunderwolf Cavalry is often a good shout. They can move up the board very quickly as they can advance and charge. Wolf and maybe aren't quite as strong for them right now. They're very dangerous if they do get into melee, but just aren't quite as tanky to enemy fire compared with how they used to be. Otherwise, their Terminators are some of the most flexible in the game. They have plenty of their own unique options for troops, such as Grey Hunters and Blood Claws, both of which are quite good compared with standard tactical marines. And of course, many, many unique characters to lead them into battle, I think more than any other chapter. When they do get into melee, they again hit extra hard, they can get plus one to hit on the charge, and if you're willing to spend some command points, they can get the Assault Doctrine early, and also plus one to wound. There aren't many things more devastating than a tooled up Space Marine melee unit with all the buffs active. So again, Marine melee, maybe a little bit more slower moving and indomitable compared with the Blood Angels. Next we come to the Xenos Hunter Space Marines, the Death Watch, who are pretty much an entire army of hyper elite Space Marines whose tactics mainly tend to focus around close-range shooting from flexible strike teams, often made up of composite parts from multiple different units. They often deploy these units by teleporting into battle, they can put units in reserve this way, or use their Beacon Angelus to jump a squad right up towards the front of the army at turn 1 to get stuck in straight away. As Xenos Hunters, they always get B-roll ones to hit in melee versus them, and a bunch of unique stratagems to help deal with each kind of Xenos in turn and their standard bolter armed infantry are just so much more dangerous than standard space marines as they can use special issue ammunition to choose the absolute most devastating round for the target that they're firing at. Deathwatch really do have quite a lot of tricks to deploy revolving around these infantry squads. They've got quite a lot of stratagems that can upgrade them in various different ways and they can also choose the order of their combat doctrines if you did want to get to tactical doctrine right from turn 1. In general, the Deathwatch armies do tend to play quite differently to quite a lot of other space marine forces. Currently, I describe them as moderate to strong, they are space marines and can use all the nastiest things that they can use, but just maybe aren't quite as all-round competitive as some of the other options. Moving on from the core space marine codex now, we come to the Grey Knights. Again, these are absolutely hyper elite, so they're likely to be outnumbered by their foes, but pretty much every single unit in the army is a psyker, and even their most basic troops armed with powerful force weapons and storm bolters, making them pack a punch both at range and in melee. Typically, Grey Knight's forces are going to be quite low in numbers, maybe some Terminators advancing up the board to take the midfield, and a bunch of other squads teleporting in around them to put some close-range hurt on the enemy. As Demon Hunters, they are particularly good against killing anything with the Demon keyword. In particular, their Rites of Banishment smite attacks are extra powerful against them, though the actual Chaos Demon army itself is quite good at countering that, as they can bring back some units from the dead when they're against Grey Knight's. For some decent firepower and raw muscle, they have their Dread Knight Walkers, often some of the hardest hitting things in their army, and often one of the most powerful Grey Knight's tactics is to stack a bunch of their psychic powers, buffs and synergies all on one big unit of Paladins. These elite Terminators can provide a really durable battle line, and pretty much delete anything that they touch in close combat. Additionally, Grey Knight armies that are just Grey Knights get the Tides of the Warp ability. Probably the most useful thing for that is to make all of your units just that bit harder to kill, they get cover saves against ranged attacks, so they should hopefully make melee at least. So you can swap it out for some really extra powerful smiting if it makes more sense to in the matchup that you're in. Currently, I say that Grey Knights are a fairly middling strength army, perhaps struggling a bit in 9th edition, now they can't just spam unlimited smites like they could in 8th. Moving on from the various ranks of Space Marines now, we come to the Adeptus Custodes. These Guardians of Terror are even more elite than the Grey Knights and Death Watch with pretty much every model having the stat line of a character model. After the core codex options, they do have really quite limited shooting, and tend to be a solid shield wall type army that's slogging their way up the board while being really hard to kill, and then getting into combat and putting out some very dangerous melee. The units that are available from Forge World add a significant amount to the army, getting them quite a lot of ranged fire support options, and certainly help to make the army that bit more balanced. The vast majority of their strategies are going to revolve around Custodian Guard and their Terminators, Two flavours of very hard to shift and very dangerous melee infantry, ideally backed up with some of their firepower from Forge World. For 9th edition missions, it really helps that they have army wide objective secures. It means that even their characters and small units can really help to shift enemy units off objectives, which is very important indeed for 9th edition missions. There are also some other variants that you can play with them, such as running a few Sisters of Silence if you really want to make psychic armies suffer, or you could go quite heavy on their Virtus Praetor jet bikes for some very fast moving generalist melee threats. Overall, as a faction, they're really strong at the moment, 
A lot of armies are just going to really struggle to get through that level of golden armour. The Adeptus Auroritas, or Sisters of Battle, are fairly well balanced, not quite as elite model per model as the Space Marines, and much of their army is Toughness 3 infantry, but clad in decent power armour for fairly good protection. Just on their raw stats, they do tend to be a bit more suited to ranged combat rather than melee, generally drawing up fairly powerful gun lines where they purge the foe with melters, flamers and bolters, ideally at close range. They do have some exceptions to this rule though, exorcists being excellent anti-tank fire at long range, and a couple of units such as mortifiers and sister repenture being absolutely devastating melee units, hitting incredibly hard though maybe not being all that hard to kill in return. They're very very strong in the game right now, in particular things like their retributors with multi-melters, who are some of the most efficient anti-tank firepower that you can possibly get in 40k. I'd say the sisters codex is really quite interesting and well written, and they've got a couple of interesting mechanics thrown in there as well, such as their miracle dice. These are quite fun to use, as it means that you can auto-pass certain important rolls, such as charge rolls, or get automatic sixes for their damage, and I think that the mechanic has been really quite well implemented, and it's interesting to play with in-game. They also have Shield of Faith, giving every single sister a 6 plus invul save, so they've at least got a small chance of shrugging off damage, and can have a little bit of a chance to deny enemy psychic shenanigans as well. In general for sisters, the majority of their army is going to be moving up the board on foot, cutting down tanks with powerful melter and exorcist fire, with a bunch of hammer blows that they can drop into the midst of the enemy, things like Repenture, Seraphim, Zephyrim, and Mortifiers. Moving on, we come to the forces of the Adeptus Mechanicus, and the Servants of the Omnisire can certainly put out a fair bit of scary firepower on the table. Lots of the Abmech units tend to just be very strong gunline units, things like Castron Servitors, Castellan Robots, Orange Dune Crawlers, Scorpius Disintegrators, and Iron Strider Ballistari. You've really got quite a lot of efficient choice between gun platforms, and then that can be further buffed by various characters with powerful Warlord traits. To keep the enemy off their back while they're unleashing all this devastating firepower, they have some really nice disruption units, things like Cerberus Raiders, Archaeopter Fusilavs, and their Taraxi units, which can really disrupt the enemy and stop them from getting to grips with them. They don't tend to do quite as much melee as some other factions, but it's not that they don't have any options for this. In particular, Forgerite Electro Priests in transports are really quite powerful, and a few of these moving up the board can potentially even get turn 1 charges in the right Forge world, and put a lot of enemies to the sword before they even know what's happening. In terms of tricks, the army has Canticles of the Omnisire, this allows your entire army to get certain buffs depending on what you're going to be doing most that turn. Getting a little bit of extra firepower or extra durability can be quite nice, and some Forge Worlds have their own really powerful options, such as getting buffs to their invul saves or heavy weapons. Currently, I'd say that Admeg are really quite a strong army in 40k. They've definitely got multiple solid options, though don't tend to top tournaments all the time. Next up, we come to the forces of the Astra Militarum, or Imperial Guard the poor brutalised humans trying to deal with a galaxy of horrors. The vast majority of the Guard Codex is all about infantry, tanks and artillery, and they can really focus on any of these elements in a force, having huge sprawling platoons that are above 200 men, entire forces of Lehman Rust tanks, or a really powerful artillery section with some minimal screening support. In general, they tend to do numbers more than they do quality. Your average Guardsman armed with a LAS gun doesn't exactly tend to do much when faced against Space Marines and things, but they do their best to make up from that by deploying a lot of them onto the table. In general, the faction is really quite ranged focused, there are very few melee units available, with Borgrim being a notable exception, so we're going to have to do most of the killing with las guns and demolisher cannons. For their infantry, you often want a fair few officers around, as one of their main faction tricks is doing orders, which give really powerful buffs to infantry squads, such as shooting twice or being able to move exceptionally far, and get a lot more effectiveness out of the squads than you really should be able to. Aside from everything you've mentioned, Guard can do mechanised infantry really quite well, their Chimera tanks are really quite efficient at the moment, and they can be quite hardy to clear off objectives, even if they don't do absolutely tons of damage. Finally, for a bit of support, you can use things like Tempestus Scions to drop in and melt some enemies. They can provide some slightly more elite close-range shooting units to provide a bit more of a precision tool to complement the general hammer blow that is the Guard force in general. Despite all of this, the Guard really aren't all that strong in 40k right now, they tend to struggle with matchups against Space Marines in particular, as Boltifier is quite efficient against their infantry, and high impact melter weapons tend to take down their tanks quite easily too. They'll definitely be looking forward to a new codex in 9th. Lastly, for the Imperial armies, we come to the Imperial Knights, who do play a bit differently compared with most of the rest of the forces, as they're essentially an entire army made up of super heavy walkers. If you're just playing pure knights, you're only going to have a few of these guys around. 
but pretty much every one can lay down really decent firepower and step on things quite well in close combat as well. The main choice with army design tends to be how many armagers, the smaller knights, or how many allies to bring, as knights really do tend to profit from allies, just having a few extra units to hold the line and do grunt work like secure objectives. They only really have three unit types, Questorius pattern knights, the standard size ones that you can see here, the Dominus pattern ones that tend to have very heavy shooting, though not quite as solid in close combat, and their mini armager knights, the Helverins to provide a bit of fire support, or the Warglaives to be a bit more of a melee and anti-tank menace. One of the biggest strengths about the knights is that they have really quite decent relics and warlord traits, each one's providing quite a decent buff to a really powerful model, so it's really good to load up on those where possible. At the moment, knights and knights tend to be fairly weak, though I'd say that this is more due to the missions that are played than the strength of the actual models themselves. They just struggle to do things like holding down objectives quite as well, and often the terrain can be against them in missions. I'd say that knights perhaps aren't the most varied in terms of factions to play. Most games are going to go fairly similarly with them, with the opponents just trying to frantically take down the big super heavy walkers, while you try and stomp around squashing their units. So leaving the Imperium behind now, we now get to Chaos Space Marines. The dark mirror of their loyalist society's kin, they are very elite, well armoured, and definitely tend to lean into melee and close combat quite a bit more than their loyalist counterparts. With a few of their slightly more recent releases, including Lord Discordance and various demon engines, Games Workshop do seem to be trying to push a bit more of a demon-focused strategy, building around Lords Discordant and Masters of Possession. As with Space Marines, there really are quite a lot of divergences based on the actual individual sub-faction that you play. Each one gets a bunch of different stratagems, relics and warlord traits. Black Legion particularly work well with Terminators, and Abaddon himself is really quite a particularly nasty character point for point. Iron Warriors tend to be one of the most gunliney factions, and are quite good with big heavy weapons and tanks. Alpha Legion might be one of the most powerful Chaos Space Marine Legions right now. They've got tons of tricks for redeploying units and confounding enemy units when they arrive, and other nasty things like making enemy vehicles automatically explode, as well as their chapter tactic being quite annoying, making them minus one to hit at long range. World Eaters go for all-round melee power, and their Red Butcher's Terminator squad that they can put down is really quite scary. Word Bearers are particularly good for building around possessed Chaos Space Marines, Obliterators, or anything else that's partly demon. Emperor's children fight first, and tend to synergize around really big squads of Chaos Marines, such as Noise Marines with lots of sonic weapons. Night Lords go in for leadership manipulation, terror tactics with things like Raptors and Warp Talons featuring heavily. And even beyond the standard legions, there are many different warband rules, such as Red Corsairs with their focus on Chaos Marines, and the Purge with their efficient firepower being able to focus down enemy units one by one. You can even run them as a Creations of Bile army, if you have Fabius Bile in your list, generally going in for a bit of all-round melee might, and Bile being able to enhance his creations even further. In terms of key units, a lot of Space Marine lists tend to feature Obliterators or Havocs, double shooting with their Endless Cacophony stratagem. This can be really quite a powerful single punch to leave a lot of the enemy army dead. Chaos Space Marines in general do tend to lean quite heavily into really big synergy type things, stacking multiple different prayers, psychic buffs, and character auras all on one unit to really boost something up that had a fairly mediocre stat line into something that's really scary. Demon Engines, Lords of Skulls, and Lord of Discordance are really quite potent, and in particular Helldrakes can be quite annoying for the enemy army. They don't tend to do masses of damage, but it can be pretty annoying to have your units tied up by them turn 1. Overall, I'd say that they're fairly moderate strength, some powerful tricks and good combos that can come together, but I think they're really looking forward to their Space Marines and Terminators getting extra wounds when their 9th edition codex eventually comes out. Moving on to their more divergent legions, we come to Death Guard. The Sons of Mortarian have just had their recent codex out, it is very powerful, and compared with their standard Chaos Brothers, they tend to be slow, purposeful, and disgustingly resilient. Every single standard model will be toughness 5 and minus 1 damage to any attacks that target it, and they'll generally be aiming to grind down their opponents in a war of attrition. Both their Plague Marines and Terminators will be solid elite units for holding the battle line. Generally heavy firepower and more hard-hitting things tend to come from demon engines, things like bloat drones with flesh mowers or plague burst crawlers with entropy cannons. The Primarch Mortarian himself is a real murder machine, very tough and problematic for a lot of armies to deal with, and they've got some excellent objective securing chaff in Pogswalkers. One of their nastiest new army-wide abilities is their Contagions of Nurgle. If you get too close to them, you're going to be minus one toughness, and this makes their plague weapons that bit more effective. They'll be wounding you very easily indeed. Currently, I'd say that Death Guard are very strong to top tier. It seems they're already making waves in tournaments, 
and I'm sure that they will be going forwards. Next we come to the Thousand Sons. Again, compared with standard Chaos Space Marines, they do tend to be slow, purposeful, and very resilient, though maybe not quite taking it to the same extreme as Death Guard. They tend to supplement their kind of mediocre damage output with all sorts of magic tricks and psychic powers though, to really get the edge up over their foes. Thousand Sons have a very powerful psychic phase, with lots of mortal wounds coming out of them, and lots of other things to keep your units safe, or impede the progress of the enemy. Their unit choices are perhaps a little bit limited, Generally, you're going to have sorcerers or demon princes as their leaders to cast psychic spells, leading a battle line of rubric marines, scarab terminators, and maybe some zangors for stealing objectives, and a bit of close combat punch. Magnus, being a demon primarch, is a massive threat in his own right, will delete most things in melee, and can put out some incredibly powerful psychic attacks too. Maybe not quite as powerful and all-round easy to use as his brother Mortarion, though. As well as their standard tricks and powers, they do have some other options, such as redeploying units with the Court of Duplicity, Risen Rubrique to get a whole bunch of Rubric Marines right into the centre of the board turn 1, and lots of stratagems and psychic powers to manipulate their own psychic phase and make all their schemes go off more easily. Currently though, the Thousand Sons are kind of weak compared with other armies. Like Grey Knights, they didn't really appreciate having their unlimited smites taken away, and often I think to get the most out of them, they really want to be run alongside other Chaos allies, something with a bit more raw muscle or durability, while the Thousand Sons get up to their tricks. So next let's move on to the Chaos Demons, who perhaps play some of the most differently to any faction in Warhammer 40k, as they're sort of a fantasy army in a sci-fi setting. As to be expected, they're almost entirely melee centric, with only a few ranged units to speak of, though can still have quite a bit of variance between the different units, either being very hordy with tons of lesser demons, or going for a bit more of a monster mash style list, with lots of greater demons such as Keepers of Secrets and Lords of Change. Of course, which demon god is played is also a really big difference. Slanesh demons are incredibly fast, strike first in close combat, and tend to have an absolute flurry of lower strength attacks. Corn demons are fairly fragile to enemy shooting, but incredibly hard hitting when they get in melee, carving through near enough anything. Nurgle demons are slow and not quite as heavy on the damage output, but are incredibly durable, with units such as Nurglings and Beasts really confounding enemy troops. And Zinch units tend to be a little bit more durable than average, having fairly high invul saves, and often go in for close range warp fire type shooting with units like Horrors, Flamers, and Burning Chariots. Aside from Corn Demons, the rest all tend to be backed up by a hefty amount of psychic spells and magic. One of the most important tricks that they have at the moment is being able to make Exalted Greater Demons, basically taking your standard Keepers of Secrets or Lords of Change and turning them into absolute murder machines, with an extra bonus trait on top of their standard ones, plus some nasty relics and warlord traits on top of that. Currently, Chaos Demons are incredibly strong with certain builds, particularly with builds like multiple Keepers of Secrets. They're maybe not quite as easy to play as some other armies though, as they really need to make the most out of charging in the fight phase, with very, very little ranged powers to speak of. Finally, for the Forces of Chaos, we come on to the Chaos Knights. Much like their Imperial counterparts, they're an entire army of super heavy walkers, and again, like standard Chaos Space Marines, they maybe tend to focus on getting stuck in in melee just that little bit more. Again, they're perhaps strongest with allies from other Chaos factions, just to cover a few weaknesses, such as not being able to secure objectives quite as easily. And in terms of their key units, they have all the similar ones to the Loyalists, doing particularly well with War Dog Swarms, and they've got their own unique Rampager and Desecrator Knights. Being able to mix and match the things on their standard Despoiler classes is helpful as well. They can go in with dual Thermal Cannons, while still being able to step on foes very well as well. Just from their innate buffs alone, they can be really quite strong, you can stack their Dread Household traits on top of the buffs that they get from Iconoclast or Infernal Devotions. In particular, Iconoclast Knights, combined with a melee Dread Household trait, can be really scary in close combat. Again, much like the Imperial Knights, they are a bit weak when they don't have allies. Knights Edition missions aren't particularly kind to them, though the raw strength of their units can be quite good. So now we move on to the forces of the Xenos, and we start with Craftworld Eldar. The Space Elves of any flavour tend to be very fast, hard-hitting, and relatively fragile compared with other armies. The Craftworlds do tend to be a little bit harder-hitting at range than in melee. The majority of their army is only Strength 3, which doesn't help them on that end, and often a lot of focus from a Craftworld Eldar list is building around their Farseers and the psychic buffs and debuffs that they can provide. Currently, some of their scariest units are Dark Reapers and Grav Tank range damage, Shining Spears and Jet Bikes as fast-moving threats, Guardian Bombs coming in from the Webway and unleashing Shuriken Fire, and the various Eldar Wraith units, which sort of provide a bit of a counterpoint to the rest of the army, being a lot more slow-moving, durable, and resilient. 
Eldar in general like to have quite a lot of shenanigans to outwit and outmaneuver their opponents. They can redeploy units on the first turn, fire and phase to move after shooting, and zooming things all the way to the other side of the board with their quickening psychic power. In particular, for focusing down one scary threat, they can both use Doom and Jinx to make all their firepower ridiculously more effective against one unit. Unfortunately, despite having a lot of really cool synergies, Eldar aren't doing all that amazing at the moment. Just quite a lot of their units are quite overpriced for exactly what they do. I think they might be experiencing a bit of an overcorrection from 8th edition, where they were ruling the roost for quite a while. The Dark Kin of the Craft Worlds, the Drakari, exhibit really quite a lot of the same sort of characteristics. Very fast moving, quite fragile units that hit very, very hard. They have quite a lot of melee units compared with the Craft Worlds, often jumping out of flying transports such as Raiders and Venoms to get stuck into the foe. The Drakari do tend to be split into three different factions. They have Cabals, Witch Cults, and Hemunculus Covens. The Cabals tend to be fairly shooty, a whole bunch of poison weapons and lance attacks. The Witch Cults go in for gladiatorial combat, fairly flimsy units with a bunch of low strength attacks and haywire things to deal with things in melee. And Hemunculus Coven flesh crafters, creating great lumbering beasts that are very, very tough and muscle the enemy to death in close combat. Again, much like the Craftworld Eldar Wraith units, they're a bit of a counterpoint to the rest of the army, making it a very durable core that can hold down some objectives. Classically though, Dark Eldar are one of the fastest units in Warhammer 40k, very fast and hard-hitting transport, jet bikes, flyers and other winged threats such as Helions and Scourges. Drukhari have an escalating power from Pain Table, which means that it gets stronger and stronger as the battle goes on. They start off just that little bit more resilient than they would normally be, then going on to making easier charges and being far stronger in melee. Currently, I'd say in terms of army strength, they're fairly moderate, doing a little bit better than their craft world kin, particularly after their points adjustments. But really, with a codex coming out quite so soon, it's going to depend on what that gives them, as opposed to anything that they have right now. For the third flavour of Eldar, we have the Harlequins. Much like the others, they're very fast and very hard-hitting when they get into range, and very fragile if you can bring your units to bear on them, which is a bit of a challenge. Harlequins might be one of the most frustrating armies to play against in 40k right now. They have near endless tricks to confound their opponents, with things like making their weapon ranges a lot shorter than they should be, movement shenanigans to allow them to fall back from combat even after they've charged, and a lot of their army sporting invul saves and minus one to hit. Harlequins armies often tend to have lots of troops mounted up in their transports, a bunch of fast jet bikes, and move at crazy speeds for turn to focus down and kill enemy units. If they're ever locked up in close combat, they can just jump straight out and jump over your troops and engage what they want, accompanied by some very nice buffing characters and some very hard-hitting Skyweaver jet bikes that can slaughter through Space Marines with ease. Despite a very limited pool of units, Harlequins are absolutely top tier in 40k right now. They're just a murderously efficient army when played well, preventing opposing forces for ever bringing their force to bear. Next we have the forces of the hive mind when we come to the Tyranids. They'll be looking like a swarm of alien bugs no matter what list you put together, but you can have a fair bit of variation, either going for absolutely vast swarms of the little grivelers, or going for a bit more of a Nidzilla type approach with things like Carnifexes, Hive Tyrants, or Forge World Critters. In general, the army tends to be more focused on melee than ranged, though their few shooting options do actually tend to be really quite strong. Things like Exocrines and Hive Guard are really quite scary to be seeing on the other side of the table. Their leaders will typically augment the swarm with their psychic powers, and they can make enemy psychic powers just that little bit harder to cast with their Shadow in the Warp ability. In terms of their iconic units, they'll often have big swarms led by Synapse creatures, a bunch of little guys surrounding a few big hitters. They can have some incredibly fast-moving Gene Stealers, zooming across the table to engage you right from turn 1. And as of the last Imperial Armor Compendium update, a couple of their really big beasties, the Dimeserons and Hyra Jewels, got very strong indeed, and they might be appearing in a few more competitive lists. One of their scariest special tricks that they have is using the swarm laws to allow double movement on certain units, catapulting one scary threat forward and engaging something that the army wouldn't normally be able to. In terms of their current strength, I'd say they're on the moderate to weaker end of the spectrum, maybe not quite as all-round efficient as certain other armies, but they do have some interesting builds, particularly hoardy ones, that have done quite well at tournaments lately. Next we have the Tyranid's treacherous Xenos followers, the insidious Gene Stealer cults, who are perhaps the most guerrilla warfare themed army in Warhammer 40k. For the most part, the Gene Stealer cults don't tend to be all that elite, a fairly rugged infantry force, though equipped with some really quite powerful weapons, particularly things like mining weapons when they get stuck in in close combat. They do have a few vehicle and transport options, though they do tend to be quite limited. 
In general, I'd say their units aren't all that efficient point for point. They're basically expecting you to make good use of their efficient stratagems and redeployment options. You can often pop your units up right next to the enemy forces and absolutely lay waste to them before they have any chance to strike back. For covering a few more of their battlefield roles, it often makes sense to ally with Brood Brother Imperial Guard or Tyranids, both of which can add some other interesting dimensions to the army. Perhaps their most iconic units are Acolytes and Aberrants, coming out of Deep Strike and just charging into something and killing everything, often backed up with powerful support characters that can make them really hard hitting when they come in. For objective holding and grunt work, they have Neophyte Hybrids, their standard troops with guns, and they have a couple of their own vehicles, including the Achilles Ridge Runners, which do some fairly efficient firepower, and Goliath Rock Grinders with their Drill Dozer Blades. Really though, I think the biggest draw to playing the army is to be able to jump in some powerful infantry units right next to the opponent, and then go to town on them with things like hand flamers and mining weapons. Cult Ambush is an interesting mechanic, as well as just Deep Strike, you can also use it to hide your army's setup and better react to the enemy army. In general though, despite having some fairly powerful set pieces, I think Gene Stealer Cults are really quite hard to use and are fairly weak as a faction. They can still do well when played absolutely optimally, but compared with nearly any other army, they're really punished if you make any mistakes. Next up we come to the Orcs. Orcs tend to be a numerous army, generally quantity over quality is the way that they go, and it's not uncommon to see enormous hordes of Orcs take to the table. In general from their standard profiles, their melee does tend to be more scary than their shooting, though some of their mech guns, walkers and other choices can be decent at range as well. There are quite a fair few ways to play orcs, there's the standard green tide where you just take as many boys as possible and charge down the opponent's face. Games Workshop have been really trying to push the idea of speed war with a whole bunch of their unique boggies, bikes, trucks and other fast movers, and you can build entire armies of orc walkers with their death dreads, killer cans and gork and walkernauts. For their core damage dealers, I'd be looking at things like boys and mega knobs, who can deal out an appropriate amount of violence at close range, and the orcs have some excellent support characters to lead them into battle, war bosses who can provide a lot of strength and allow them to advance and charge, weird boys to fry some enemies and jump the boys all over the board, big mechs with some force fields to protect their creations and the lads as they move up, and pain boys to help put some injured orcs back together. Adding in a few buggies, dreads or fire support units can often be helpful as well to give them a little bit more ranged punch. Orcs tend to be fairly straightforward in the way that they approach the enemy, though they do have a few tricks of their own. Their jump can be really useful to catapult the boys right into the enemy turn 1, and they've got a fair bit of customization on some of their walkers with their custom jobs. They can often turn them from fairly underwhelming choices into really really nice ones. Currently I'd say that orcs are fairly moderate in strength, they do have a fair amount of raw power, but several of their units tend to be not all that durable unless protected by expensive characters. The forces of the Necrons have had plenty of new units reawakened for them at the start of 9th edition has really breathed a bit more new life into the faction. Durability and reanimation is perhaps what the Necrons are known best for. Once you shoot their infantry and vehicles, they might well just reanimate and get straight back up, or repair their own injuries with their living metal. They're maybe not quite as fast or quite as hard hitting, though they can put out a fair bit of damage both in close range fire support and a lot of their new melee options. Necrons really do have quite a large unit roster to choose from, lots of which are very functional and very good to use. Perhaps their single scariest threat on the table is the Nightbringer, who can go through virtually any character in one round of combat. Their Katar can't be shot down over one single turn, so they're almost always going to be a problem for the opponent's armies. For the core of their army, they often like to build around their warrior squads, Lich Guard or Scarabs, and if you did want to invest quite a lot of points in holding the midfield, you could even bring the Silent King along, who can make close combat armies have a really bad time by making them fight last against him. In addition, for their other tricks, they have command protocols, which if you're all from the same dynasty, you can plan out a helpful buff for your warriors to have each turn as they go forward, though often the rewards for this are quite slight. One of their custom dynasties also allow them to do some powerful pre-game moves to seize control of the midfield objectives before the game has even really started. Currently, with all their options, Necrons are really quite well balanced and strong, and they have quite a lot of ways to achieve their ends, though I'd expect the Nightbringer and some Scarabs to appear in a lot of competitive lists. Next up we come to the Zotes, one of the lesser played factions in 40k. They're really quite strong, have good anti-tank shooting, and are quite powerful in melee as well. They don't have all that many attacks, so are a bit stronger against vehicles and heavy hitters than infantry, and they are quite slow moving. Probably their single most important unit is the Archivist, as their unit pool is really quite limited, and in terms of special tricks, they do have minus one leadership at three inches from every single unit in their faction, 
though it isn't really the most powerful right now, as leadership isn't the strongest in ninth. Currently, I'd say they are struggling as a faction a bit, they're still awaiting their 9th edition codex, and they work better with allies due to their limited unit pool. In general, on the table, Azotarm is largely going to consist of one single model with a Blackstone Fortress datasheet moving up towards the enemy. There's only so much that you can really do with that. Finally, we come to the Tau Empire, another one of the more skewed factions in Warhammer 40k, as they basically don't do any melee, and are entirely focused at gunning down the enemy at range. The majority of their firepower is fairly flexible, mounted on flying units with at least a decent amount of mobility, and often supported by things like gun drones and shield drones to shield them from harm, and multiple focused marker lights to really make sure that one unit gets shot to death each turn. You're likely to want some fire warriors or crew to hold the battle line, some crisis suit commanders that can deal solid firepower in their own right, then all manner of backfield gun line units to try and take down the enemy, so hopefully that ground is for the taking. In terms of special tricks, their commanders can deploy either Montcar or Kayun, either to give the army a big surge of mobility, or to allow an exceptionally devastating shooting phase from your gunline castle. To help try and get around the lack of close combat ability, tower units can overwatch for each other with the For the Greater Good special rule, and ideally, if you have a lot of units supporting each other, it might actually be really quite hard for the opponent to justify charging some of them. There might not be all that much point if most of their units are going to get shot to death in their own charge phase. Unfortunately, at the moment, Tau aren't really having the best time of it, they're quite weak as 40k factions go. 9th edition missions really mean that they have to push forward, which they can do, but that does mean that they're more likely to get engaged in combat, and it's just quite a lot harder to command than a faction with some actual melee units. Definitely a challenge, and I think that Tau are one of the factions that are most waiting for their 9th edition codex to breathe a bit of life back into them. So anyway, I hope you found the video fun. Feel free to elaborate on other playstyles for your faction down in the comments below. There's so many interesting things in 40k that it's very hard to cover everything all in one video. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, but we'll certainly keep regular 40k content coming pretty much every day, usually of a little bit more of a tactics and strategy focused nature. Finally, if you have enjoyed the video, I'd just like to mention that I have a Patreon page, which you can find down in the video description. The channel's Patreon is how I can spend quite so much time making videos like this, particularly big ones where we talk through all the factions do take really quite a while to make. If you are watching regularly, any support is massively appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, such as seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the channel's regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some big model kits. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then the link is down in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.